Hello, everyone. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, you do. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the um, second lecture of our bio block of uh, Shukhov Lab um, lectures dedicated to urban modularity, to the advanced 3D printing techniques. Uh, today, I would like you. I would like to introduce Aaron Outwhite from uh, Halifax, Canada. <laughs> Hello, Aaron. Hi. Um, he is a PhD candidate in chemical engineering. He is a researcher, a scientist, and uh, today he will be talking about urban metabolism and. Uh, about his experience, experience and experiments in biocomposite materials. Um, welcome, Aaron. Uh, it's your turn to speak. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, like Anton said, my name is Aaron. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in, in chemical engineering, um, more specifically process engineering at Dallas University uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is in Canada, on the east coast of the country, so North Atlantic, uh, North Atlantic region. Um, and I'm very happy to present my, some of my work. So what we're going to be talking about today is um, sort of a, I'm going to cast a wide net over kind of what I do here. Um, so I've titled this presentation, Urban Metabolism and Advanced Manufacturing with Engineered Living Materials. So let me just kind of give some context to what we're talking about here. So when we talk about urban metabolism, we're talking about um, the idea that cities input materials, raw materials, uh, product materials, food materials, that, that stuff is, is processed in some way. So it's consumed, um, it's metabolized, it's, it's, it waste is generated in some, in some way. And then we take those waste materials and we put them back in, into the natural ecosystem. So, this idea of city metabolism as a, as a throughput of, of <clears throat> ecological materials is kind of what we look at. And we look at that, that, that footprint of what we need in terms of raw resources, how materials are processed and used for, for applications in the city, and then what we do with those materials when we're done with them. So our approach to this kind of problem is, is to think about uh, closed ecological systems or to kind of mimic what happens in nature with respect to material cycling and and the idea of raw resources uh, becoming new resources and those resources becoming raw resources again. So we design uh, principally around this idea of urban metabolism and this idea of controlled ecological system design. And this is pretty common uh, and you see it uh, applied to uh, space travel and um, so this system here is developed by NASA, uh, controlled ecological life support systems developed for space uh, applications. The idea being that um, every kilogram of weight you have leaving the Earth's atmosphere costs a ton of money in space. So food, uh, water, atmosphere, these kind of things, if you can regenerate them or produce them in space, um, that's much more efficient. So we kind of take this idea of urban metallism and we, and we talk about this idea of closed loop ecology from a system side. Um, and we, we look at examples from NASA, um, some of the former uh, Soviet Union stuff of the BIOS uh, project, these kind of things. And we, we try and mimic these kind of systems. Um, let's move forward here. Sorry, this just moving, just trying to move forward with the slide. <laughs> Okay, so this idea of closed ecologies from NASA, um, there are some examples now um, in architecture and in, in, in terrestrial applications. So Des Algen House in Germany, where they put microalgae into the um, facade. Um, and they, they use the sunlight to actually grow these, these microorganisms to produce materials and to um, tailor energy production in that, in that building. So we, we like this kind of system, we like this kind of using urban waste um, to produce a biomass. And then a bit more practical, the uh, Biosphere 2 in Arizona in the US, uh, where they actually built um, a closed ecological system for, for long-term habitation. 
this is actually a pretty incredible space because they have seven different ecosystems within it from, from desert to um, ocean and it's all enclosed within this giant building uh, that be behaves essentially like a closed natural ecosystem, but they're recycling all the materials and they're producing all their food and everything else. Um, so um, in terms of, so that's how we kind of look at uh, urban metabolism. In terms of advanced manufacturing, um, I'm not going to talk about our kind of starting with plastics because uh, that's pretty common. Uh, we pretty quickly got into large scale, the idea of using large scale um, advanced manufacturing techniques. Um, plastics, we've, we've always been, our, my research has always been about trying to replace plastics fundamentally as a, as a, as a material we use in culture. Um, and so applied to advanced manufacturing, there, there wasn't a lot of interest in doing um, sort of small scale, bench scale stuff. Our interest was really looking at these large scale big area additive manufacturing system. So the one you see here, it, it's actually printing a boat hull uh, all as one part. They've printed a submarine. So it's kind of bonkers, big um, advanced manufacturing systems. That's kind of what we've been looking at. And in terms of clay, I mean, we started where I think a lot of people did um, with, you know, the do-it-yourself um, clay extruder systems. Uh, this one by Jonathan Keep was the, actually the first one we built. Um, and we built that as part of a, an engineering design course uh, slash architecture course here in Halifax where we had students. We basically built this as part of the lab um, and then we had students hack away at it and see what they could do with it. Um, so we kind of started where a lot of people did. We, we kind of rejected the idea of plastics. We thought big was interesting. Um, we started as a, at a do-it-yourself level um, by kind of copying other people's work essentially. Uh, we've been really inspired by some of the other big big stuff. So like Enrique, Enrico Dini in, in Italy and, and the D-shape uh, powder-based additive manufacturing. So this is a big machine. It does really cool stuff. So we're, we're always kind of looking at how we can use the materials we have and um, how we can push them through machines in interesting ways. Um, we're also really inspired by um, different additive manufacturing techniques. So this idea of using rocks and string um, and jammed architectural printing. So this, this machine actually prints pebbles and string it and packs it all together. And then you can, you have a structure built out of, uh, with no, no glue, no, no adhesion, nothing. Um, so that's a pretty cool idea. So we're always kind of thinking like, how else can we get at these sort of things? Um, we also do a lot of research. I do a lot of research in, in gel-based printing. So um, immersion-based techniques where we can get to uh, clay or concrete printing without using support material and really exploring like the extents of what we can do with geometry. Um, and then this idea of like self-assembling or swarm-based, agent-based 3D printing. Uh, so this, this one done with um, at MIT where they kind of, the 3D printer is part of the actual assemblage and moves alongside the printer, I mean, that's that's pretty interesting. So we're trying to think about um, stuff like that in terms of our machine design. So advanced manufacturing for us doesn't just mean like extrusion-based clay, it means the entire scope of manufacturing methods we can do, or we can use with these, um, these essentially products from urban waste. So engineered living materials, the final part of this title. So this is a kind of a new term that we're seeing applied to um, different engineering systems the idea here is that we're designing materials from the cellular level to, to actually perform uh, some sort of function. So in this kind of classic image of, of an engineered, engineered living material, we're actually, instead of starting from a seed in a tree, we're designing sort of a protocell um, that would produce all the functions of the tree, but we wouldn't have the necessarily the, uh, the natural growth structure to be very much ordered. And this is, this is a fairly common idea about engineered living materials in that we're, we're, we're basically genetically engineering bacteria to produce biopolymers. Um, and that's, that's a pretty interesting approach, but we actually think of engineered living materials a little different. We think of uh, anything that we design that actually prov provides a life support function. So that means it's not just a cell, it could be the, the thing the cell lives in. That could also be an engineered living material. So this is how we look at it. We look at things like urban metabolism in terms of the materials we can get, we look at advanced manufacturing, and then we look at building materials that have uh, more than one program. So some of the stuff that we really like um, in terms of engineered living materials are some of the, the more conceptual based approaches to architecture and design. Um, so like the in vitro meat house, uh, the idea being that the whole house would be built out of meat cells and then uh, would be, behave exactly like a human heart would. 
so um, things like um, windows would be um, more like cavities and, and, and run by muscles rather than apertures. Um, so if we created, let's say, a scaffold that the meat cells could grow in, then we could actually arguably get at something like this house. Um, the um, I'm Lost in Paris project by Reeson from about 10 years ago, uh, where they coupled glass blowing and sort of ecological design to create a building system that grows over time. So this idea of like rainwater harvesting, nutrient harvesting, um, system design, architecture, um, and then an engineered living material. So this glass here would be the living material in this in this scenario. Um, <clears throat> just kind of a bit closer to home and a bit more normal is, is this idea of, of moss living on barks or on concretes in within an urban environment. So this kind of symbiosis between uh, the condition the, the bark is producing to support the growth and, and then the, the moss itself. So fundamentally we like this idea of a tree, and, but we, we don't necessarily want to start with a cell. We want to mimic the tree's performance as a, as a building material. So the sponginess, the weather protectivity, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, this is kind of what we think about when we think about engineered living materials, this kind of symbiosis. So we really do rationalize this down to um, an algorithm where we actually talk about um, buildings in terms of their system. So every building has uh, a system for energy. Every building has a system to manage water. Um, Every building has a system to manage air, be it through an HVAC system or like opening a window. And we talk about all of these systems as being linked through their inputs and outputs, both with each cell and with the environment. So we're taking things in like fresh air, we're breathing it in in an indoor environment, we're, we're exhaling, that air has moisture and some pollutants in it, and that either goes back to the environment or to another part of that, that cell. So. We talk about material exchanges in this environment and we talk about these kind of cells or these systems. And then at a closer level, we talk about these cells in terms of all their internal operations. So if I'm talking about air coming through a window and breathing and then exhaling, and then maybe that air gets trapped by a plant and then maybe that plant regenerates that air into, into O2, all those subsystems are conditioning that material before it's exchanged. So we're talking again about like, a meta system in terms of let's let's say atmosphere, and then we're talking about uh, micro systems within that meta system that deal with all those metabolic products. So we've really kind of rationalized it down to a series of inputs and outputs with the environment, and then a set of a systems that that deal with those materials, um, so we can use them in an effective way. And so our approach is to use materials that we find around us. So in situ uh, resource development suggests that we use stuff that's hyper uh, local to our region and we process that material into useful stuff that we can use to kind of deal with these problems that we find with urban metabolism and waste. So we started uh, about two years ago working heavily with um, brown seaweeds, North Atlantic brown seaweeds, um, specifically the Ascophyllum nodosum, which is um, an alginate bearing seaweed. Um, it grows very, very well here near Halifax. Um, and it just, it's, it's so plentiful that it just washes up on the shore. So we just, we just walk on the beach and harvest it. Um, and we're an engineering lab. So we do, what we do is we take these seaweeds um, and then we characterize them. So in, in that particular seaweed, the biopolymer alginate, which is a common food-based biopolymer, is present. And it's somewhere between 30 and 40% of the biomass. So there's a very high yield. And we'll take that... Um, alginate out of that material and then we'll do characterization and what we really want to see is based on the season based on the the area of the seaweed we take it from what's the chemical makeup of that alginate um, because we know that in alginate there's two sugars and we know that one of those sugars creates strength and one of those sugars creates flexibility so if we can control um, those compositions then we can very accurately control the materials we make with that alginate so we do this kind of chemical characterization where we will do um, both high-end analytics, so gas chromatography and all the other stuff, but we'll also do things, basic things like gelling tests. So we'll, we'll gel and alginate, we'll exchange the water with an alcohol, we'll dry it out, we'll reinflate it. Um, we've done aerogels with this material, always just trying to get at learning about the material uh, properties at the micro level, but also um, at the structural or, or the bigger level. So, Alginates, um, we also do some high-end um, image work, so we're always looking at um, how alginates behave at the, at the pore level or the micro pore level. So 
Um, we'll create a gel, uh, we'll condition the material in some way, and then we'll, we'll put it under an, an SEM or a scanning electron microscope, and we'll look at that micropore structure to see how it's being tailored based on how we're both extracting the alginate and conditioning within our lab. So this is kind of our workflow. We, we take the material, we'll extract it, we'll characterize it and look at it, uh, and make sure we understand it at the kind of the molecular chemical level. Um, <clears throat> and then from there, our kind of agenda is to look at how these biopolymers affect um, the flow properties and, and, and kind of the way that um, larger materials that are common to the urban systems uh, behave. So clays, concretes, uh, sands, dirts, these kind of things. So once we have our material characterized um, and pulled out of the biomass we're taking it from, we just create, or I just create um, literally hundreds of samples. I just take that material and I mix it in every single possible way I can, um, using a range of different clays, a, a range of different um, cements, sands, uh, whatever I can get at, but it's all under the context of uh, in situ resource. So it's all stuff I can find almost directly around me, um, <clears throat> including stuff I collect um, here in my lab. So coffee grounds, um, eggshells, coffee filters, paper waste, um, anything that, that can be used uh, arguably as a material, I, I collect, sort, add to my fundamental biopolymer and see what happens. And we're always going after this kind of engineered living system idea. So this idea that we're, we're making objects that actually support a life function. So we do 3D printing, we do clay printing. Um, we started with an extruder printer and you know, we, we, we did all the geometry stuff um, that you see online. Um, the squiggles and stuff and we do all the we've done all the, the machine the basic clay machine stuff That's fairly typical, but we're we're kind of a material based research lab So we're not super interested in just spinning up geometry to, and, and glazing it necessarily We're more interested in how the material pushes through machines how it sets up how strong it is uh, These kind of things so we, we have done quite a bit of work on just you know making making objects and uh, like pots and cups and um, all sorts of fun sort of uh, product-based approach. We've also done some work on things like skins and ears and, and weird little objects that just test the limits of our machines. Um, but we move on pretty quickly from just straight up geometry stuff to look at applications. So one of our applications that we think about is how do we create, uh, let's say, a tile system um, that can be used to, to affect a microclimate in a building in a building case. So um, this one we designed a series of 150 tiles that we then built into a, a, a building system and it's meant to both support uh, moss growth but also uh, create a temperate uh, microclimate so it's cool um, and mossy and kind of nice. So we're, we're designing materials and systems and geometries to kind of get at um, let's say a larger question than just geometry questions that we typically see in 3D printing. Um, we also work on geometry questions. Um, probably our most, like the, the, bit, the most thing I'm interested in right now is this idea of of scaffold systems, so this kind of uh, macro pore structures, or these kind of large pores that you see here, um, coupled with the small pores that you saw earlier in the SEM photo. So something that's macro porous, micro porous, um, and can be manufactured uh, rapidly. Um, so a lot of our a lot of our work on scaling is about how quickly we can print these scaffolds and how big they are. Uh, and then we talk about details of, of joining scaffolds together into a larger architectural assembly. So we spend a lot of work on um, basically scaling and working across um, small scaffolds to large scaffolds. Uh, we also work on sort of like abstract printing techniques, so um, nonlinear. So one of the biggest conditions, um, one of the biggest things we don't like necessarily about 3D printing is like this layer by layer approach. So you always see 3D prints and they're always like horizontal layers stacked up, right? And we really want to get at this idea that the, the limitation of the machine, um, you know, the, the machine shouldn't limit the, the, the way you use the material. So, so random G-code generation or random, random path um, printing, um, different packing strategies where we're making microspheres or other things like that. Anything to kind of break up the, uh, the way we look at 3D printing and or um, allow ourselves to test our materials in kind of a new and novel way. Um, we also kind of push the limits of what the material is itself outside of, let's say, additive manufacturing. So 
in terms of engineered living materials, we work a lot at that, that on geometry and then the micro porosity. So things like water filters um, became become very doable with a with a biopolymer clay mix. Um, also things like hierarchical porosity. So you have a very small uh, pore size at one end and a very large pore size at the other end. Um, so you can control transport phenomena. Um, so we're always just trying to, again, just trying to use the materials and the biopolymer mixtures for the best manufacturing system, not necessarily 3D printing, but we're, we just work through a ton, of, a ton of stuff all the time. We're very hands-on and always doing material research. Um, and then we're kind of playful too. We, we try and take some of these composites and, and do weird things with them. So um, usually the weirder the better. So a lot of, a lot of polymers and, and clay composites uh, are characterized by high shrink rates. Um, so we, we created a material that did almost no shrinking across the, the drying phases. So much so that when we fired stuff in it, it didn't it didn't fire out. It just it just kept its shape completely. So that was really cool. Um, so yeah, we we take we look at something, we observe a, a property, and then we figure out if it's useful. Maybe it's just esoteric, but it's always something. There's always something that comes out of this this material research. Uh, more recently, we've been looking at um, like crude, uh, very crude representations of these materials. So. A lot of times in the engineering world, we'll take a, something like a seaweed and we'll process it into a, a very high value biopolymer. Um, so a lot of my research is about minimal processing. So how, how little do I have to process that biopolymer before it's useful um, to do something with? So here uh, we're taking a seaweed, just using a standard blender. Uh, with paper, we can get a, a composite material that you can make into shades or, or anything like that. Uh, chairs, um, it's basically a plastic replacement. So that's kind of interesting uh, because it takes almost no energy to make that stuff uh, and it's completely biodegradable. <clears throat> also, again, because I'm, I'm fascinated with gels and sort of this idea of artificial tissue, uh, we've been working, I've been working a lot more really you know, on, on creating uh, s strong gels out of these biopolymers. One of the problems with gels uh, created from natural materials is they typically are very weak by themselves and they have a weird um, drying phase where they get brittle. Um, so we've been working on things like um, plastic made out of biopolymer that we can also stitch with a biopolymer. So um, so like that that one, the clear one there that you see in the image is actually like stitched with with a biopolymer. So it dry, it's, it's a very interesting kind of drying mechanism. Um, or the one on the right where it's just basically a blended seaweed that creates this uh, this biofilm that we can we can cast on anything and create packaging around. Um, so exciting kind of things like that. We've been working more towards um, like stretching the, the polymers and the clay separately um, and really working at different, different applications. Um, and then super, super recently in the last uh, four weeks, we've, we've developed an ultra fast ceramics process um, using a, a seaweed, a, a paper and a clay. Um, we can print um, a cubic inch in, in less than three minutes. We can dry it in less than three minutes and we can fire it in less than six minutes. So that object in the screen here, we went from not having anything printed to a fired object in about 12 minutes. Um, so we can, that's, that's pretty fast for, for clays. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're pushing the smaller scale work right now is towards this ultra, ultra fast uh, ceramic process that we can uh, directly compete with, with plastics at the desktop scale. Um, but it's still pretty small, um, so you can see that's that's a pretty small feature. But um, it's a beautiful, robust printing system. Um, anyone who's printed with clay knows that when you print it at all, I guess, knows that you always there's always like a blown print, like one out of every three or something. Uh, but this machine, every single one I printed worked. So I was just yeah, it's like the most beautiful thing I've ever used material-wise. Um, so this is this is kind of what we're working on right now is this ultra fast, small scale system. And we're also kind of uh, changing our approach. So approach 2.0, we were using um, seaweeds, uh, but we're switching almost exclusively now to a bacteria-based system where we're, we're no longer gonna be using natural resources at all. We're gonna focus entirely on, on waste recycling. Um, so what you see here is a, it's a soil-dwelling bacteria, Azobacter vinelandi. vinelandi. Um, and it's the soil bacteria that's responsible for nitrogen fixation um, from the air to, to, to the rhizosphere of plants. So it, it, takes, it takes nitrogen out of the air and fixates it into a, a soluble salt that uh, plants can use. But during the process of that metabolism, it actually produces two biopolymers, one on the inside of its cell and one on the outside of its cell. And the one on the outside of the cell is actually a direct, it's the exact same material as alginate from seaweed. So 
we can actually produce the same biopolymer um, using metabolic waste from the city rather than harvesting seaweed from a natural ecosystem. So this is kind of, this is the next step for us um, is producing this bacteria in cultures. And we've already started, we built the bioreactor and we've already started this. Um, the exciting thing about this one too is that this bacteria produces two biopolymers, one on the in inside, one on the outside. The, the, ins the inside one's PHB, uh, which is a thermoplastic that can replace any desktop filament too. So this is uh, this is the next thing that we're doing, um, and we're working towards this literally right now. So no more natural resources, only metabolic waste uh, from cities. And we like this route because we know how these bacteria um, eat essentially, and so we're doing very accurate uh, metabolic modeling and uh, experimentation to determine exactly where all of our nutrients that we're putting into this thing are being shunted. So we can control very directly um, how much alginate is being produced by, the, by, by this bacteria versus how much PHB is being produced by the bacteria. So um, again, just working on control and learning about um, essentially how metabolism at the bacteria scale can be used to deal with metabolism at the urban scale. Um, so this is this is kind of what this is the material research we're doing right now, and then the machine research. Um, I don't have any images of our new machine because we're all we're all closed down in Canada on institutions so I haven't had access for about six months to my to my lab or four months from to my lab um, but what we've designed at, at the institute I've worked is a is a large-scale printer uh, with a, pil a, a, a printing footprint of about four foot by four foot by four foot um, so we can print large-scale stuff and we've also designed um, a new printhead which we call the the boring printhead uh, and it's, an, it's a gel immersion based printer. So we're conceiving of this large scale printer as a, a basically a big gel clay printer. So we can print without scaffold um, or, or support material. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing next. Um, it's too bad you can't see the machine because it's super cool. But that's that's the idea is, is take all these materials and, and push them through things that are actually at a, a architectural scale. Um, Okay, so that's that's actually that's the presentation. That's what I have. Um, I'm just gonna look through the uh, the questions here and see if there's any. Oh, all right. That was that was on so many levels. That was really cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm really curious to see your machine because, as you as far as you know, we're also working on a bigger machine, not yeah. not in such detail as your laboratory does, but still. Yeah, we, we should share the notes for sure. We should. Um, uh, there are some questions from, from the chat section. The first one is about your website, uh, designbyscience.com. Yeah. Is, is a little bit unavailable at the moment. Yeah, so we just changed platforms from a Canadian host to uh, uh -huh. an international host. So it's just going through the, it's just getting, it's getting set up. It should be up by the end of, uh, hopefully by the end of this week. Um, uh, I think by the time by the time the recording of this uh, presentation yeah. will be up, uh, this yeah. site will be yeah. Uh, the second question from from chat section: um, Are jellyfish adaptable for biomaterial? That's a good question. Um, you would assume so, and I mean they have so many properties um, intrinsic to them that you would think they would be like ideal uh, for this. But I actually I don't know what. Um, I don't know what what the what the polymer would be that you'd be extracting from them. Um, I personally haven't really looked. I don't use gelatin. I don't use any animal based um, biopolymers in my processes. I try to stay away from it, mostly just because it's it's a it's a really like sustainability wise. You, it's hard to rely on on you know, like jellyfish <laughs> or, or like a jellyfish harvest or anything like that. So um, yeah, we haven't really looked at it, but that would be a really interesting. Um, thing to look at. One thing we're actually super interested in right now is squid and uh, inks from squids. Um, so I guess I guess that's that's kind of like that. But yeah, we haven't looked at at jellyfish specifically. Um, I, I've heard some um, uh, pepper skins could be used as a bioprinting material, as a plastic. Like they they process somehow pepper like chili peppers and, and regular peppers skin. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, a question from me then. Um, yeah. if, if, we, if we would look for something that could be used as a bio-gelling polymer uh, without having access to Atlantic Ocean, mm. uh, what, what, what it could be? 
Right. Yeah, so that's a great question. So gelling materials or uh, hydro colloids, um, you can, you can you know, buy them anywhere, but harvesting them is a little bit more tricky. Um, and they typically come from natural resources like animals, so like gelatin um, and mm -hmm. these kind of things, uh, collagen. Or they come from uh, so like trees, so like cellulose, um, these kind of things. Uh -huh. Or um, ocean polymers, so the agars, the carrageenans, the, um, these kind of things, alginates. So the, the, the other kind of area, and this is kind of why we're switching to it, is, is the bacteria polymers where you can, you can kind of produce them anywhere. So something like xanthan gum is a, is a very common biopolymer. A lot of people know about it. And it's produced by a, a bacteria. So it's not an it's not an easy question because in the city you kind of have limited um, resources. You don't necessarily have things like seaweeds or trees or um, anything like that. So what we're thinking is that maybe um, some some bacteria harvesting from within the city from things like compost piles and these sorts of things maybe could be a way of, of producing uh, biopolymers in situ, but. And that was actually the second question I wanted to ask. Um, I'm really curious about uh, the bacteria that can produce plastics, uh, yeah. but I, I, I'm, I wonder how much bacteria do you need to produce, I don't know, one gram of plastic or one kilogram? Like yeah. It should be. Um, so, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it really does depend on the bacteria and um, <clears throat> how you know, how, how natural, let's say, that bacteria is. So a lot of research right now is on um, first identifying bacteria and then genetically modifying to do one or two things better. Um, and we see, and even like gene expression from like natural bacteria and just something like E. coli, which just becomes a small little factory produce something is fairly common. Um, but in our, in our research, we kind of want to keep it not to the, the Franken bacteria, the weird stuff, just to normal natural bacteria. Mm -hmm. And we, we see about, um, over about seven days, about 13% alginate in a solution. So if I had a, if I had a one liter solution of water, um, after about a week, that's a, there's about 13% alginate or about 26 wow. grams. That, that's a really yeah. nice result. That's so it's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. Yeah. And the nice thing about that bacteria and the, the way the alginate grows, which is as a, like a biofilm on the exterior, we can actually use um, a separation technique that doesn't kill the bacteria. We're just harvesting it off its skin, essentially. Um, so we do sort of a, a closed loop um, batch process where we're growing it for about seven days and then we basically scrape off the alginate um, and then we keep going. So yeah, it's, it's not a bad yield. Um, it's still more expensive than just harvesting and, and prepping alginate from scratch, but because we have such high control, uh, uh -huh. we, can, we can tailor all that stuff specifically so we have a lot, lot higher value uh, in the material. So yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah it's, a fairly good, it's a fairly good yield, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, we, we have one question from my friend David. David. Uh, he's asking, is there an education part in your research uh, program to encourage other people to play with some materials? Yeah, um, basically that's that's entirely what I do. Um, <laughs> so I, I work at um, Dalhousie and I work at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design and I teach in both those schools and the way I teach is uh, from a, a play approach. So if you think of like a playground, like a sandbox, um, I program that course or those courses or those teaching things by giving students these materials. So that's kind of like the boundary of the sandbox and then I let them play and I just see what they come up with. Um, and I do that through design teaching. So we do design teaching here at, at, at the Dalhousie and through NASCAD. So yeah, it's very much like a play approach. I'm always curious to, to see um, what other people come up with. And I'm also working on um, a Canada grant to do the same thing with kids. So we've, we've gone kind of on eco eco ecology walks with kids um, where we get them to kind of collect things off the beach or off the ground. And then we educate them on what the material is and then what's in it. And then we give them what's in it to play with and they create whatever. Uh, and it could be anything. It's sometimes it's really wild. And, and then we, took, we take those things and we, and we talk about you know what they could be so sometimes it's just like a figure a weird clay figure that becomes an animation sometimes it's a some sort of weird composite that we never thought about that's like oh cool that that could be like a new mesh or a new something or another so 
yeah, essentially because we do material driven design, our entire our entire research program is about putting materials into hands of people and seeing what they invent, um, and then rationalizing what that is through science. So have you found any interesting ideas that way? Yeah. I actually, I actually think it's a really interesting uh, way of educating circular economy principles when you actually take people to the field and, and yeah, and touch the material and then show how this can convert into something real. And that's what makes uh, people understand how it should work. Um, there is another question. Well, it's quite quite a long one, but if I short it out. Uh, do, do, you, do you see some interest in this uh, technology from, uh, from companies from, uh, or is it only uh, university researchers who are interested? Yeah. In uh, no, so yeah, our entire, th our entire thing is about like, it, like literally changing how cities are built. So our, our practice is all about putting stuff into the hands of industry and, and just changing it uh, fundamentally so we we do actually always think about commercial approaches and that's kind of one reason why we're switching off of uh, naturally harvested materials and working towards using waste as a resource because we always like humanity is always going to produce waste we always need to eat and we always need to drink water and all that kind of stuff so waste is strangely is actually a super sustainable uh, thing unlike biomasses or these kind of things when we start harvesting them for large-scale applications and all of a sudden there's nothing left so our yeah our program is about making um, experimenting, taking the interesting things that we find and and pushing them into in the industry to replace bad materials like plastics or things that don't decompose. Um, and we have had interest. Um, we're kind of we're kind of just coming into the commercial side of it now. We spend most of our time on R and D, uh, but we've had significant interest from uh, construction industry um, developers. Um, and even on the biopolymer side, um, from food manufacturers, um, yeah, just there's all sorts of different, there's all sorts of different angles with respect to industry. But yeah, the last thing, like really, the last thing I want to do is leave this as an academic exercise. I mean, there's just so much of that already. Um, <clears throat> there's not much value in just continuing to do academic work. Um, so yeah, it's very, it's very much meant to like literally replace existing systems that we don't find or don't think are sustainable. Um, we've also had, yeah, we've had, and I should say we've had a lot of, because we're working on this, we've had a lot of adjacent interest um, from larger corporations about recycling other things. So plastics is a big one. No one wants plastics. And as soon as we say we want to deal with you know, urban waste, we've had uh, half a dozen calls from the government, uh, big corporations in the city basically offering us anything to deal with their waste, uh, to deal with their plastics. So. Yeah, it's not just about replacing stuff. It's also becoming about taking the, the all the junk we've already made and re reusing it some way. Um, so, so, so how, how close it is to the industrial and production stage? How, what, what's your estimate? Like, uh, well, I just I just did a pitch like two weeks ago that said we were um, that we were ready for proof of concept demonstration to investors. So we're we're right there. Um, um, yeah, our, our materials are good. Our, our process that the what we're kind of talking about right now is the super fast ceramics, um, and that yeah, we we could we could go to market with that within about four months um, as a desktop replacement. So a cheap three D printer that does everything from like ketchup to clay. Um, yeah, universal system, open source. That's the kind of what we're we're working on right now. That one's about four months, uh, assuming everything in Canada opens up again, which is. <laughs> Low, uh, but yeah, we're right there. We're we're right there, um, and that one has two scales. One's a three hundred mil by three hundred mil by three hundred mil, and one's a a thousand mil, so a cubic meter. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's a complete GUI workflow. So it's like from slicing to uh, yeah to everything. So yeah, we're we're close. It's just a matter of we um, we were like ready for all this in February, and then Canada shut down. So we've been kind of sitting our hands for for six months or four months, whatever it is. Um, oh, yes. that's, that's really good news. Con congratulations on that. Uh, <laughs> you've been talking about so so many things, so I'm actually not sure what people are asking about uh, in particular. But I think uh, uh, the recycling industry is is very very promising field for for yeah. your work. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, yeah, we were really trying to think about like plastics is a good example. We're really trying to think about um, like what plastics are. So there's some interesting work on taking plastics from the city and, and recovering them. So they're, they're new filament and 3D printers and then they reprint plastics. Uh, but we're really interested in taking materials that shouldn't be in the environment and just like directly sequestering them or, or taking them right out. So instead of like recycling plastics, uh, we've been working on a system with some pretty interesting results on actually using them to, in clay bodies where we burn them out uh, mm -hmm. without oxygen so that we're not producing any toxic chemicals, but that we're still getting the burn effect from the plastic. And it's producing weird like glassy surfaces um, and depending on the plastics and how we condition them, some really interesting porous stuff. So, yeah, it's it, like it's when we talk about it, when we think about like urban ecology or the systems in, in place, we, it's a it's a matter of like replacing stuff, but also like the stuff that's being replaced. What do you what do you do with it? Um, and on that regard, like we have like two hundred years of industrial revolution, which means we have like two hundred years of waste uh, as a resource for us. So everything from like mining waste to City waste, landfills, all that stuff is for me. It's a resource, um, but it needs to be dealt with in an appropriate way. Not just not just used again in the same way it was, because it's just going to end up in a landfill. Uh, be it a three D printed product from a plastic or like a um, piece of plastic on a packaging. So, how do we fixate it? How do we turn it into a building material? How do we sequester it or convert it um, into something useful? So yeah, it's, it's it's a big it's the reason why it's so far reaching as a as a lecture is because it's a kind of a big problem, right? When you start thinking about um, how everything around you is made, everything from like the oven to the the mug you're drinking out of to the pipes in your in your you know, all that stuff has a material cost. And if you're trying to re like change that, then it, it's a matter of thinking about the entire system, not just one part of it. Um, and so it takes time, but it's it's. Be, uh, you, I, I, I think we're slowly getting there. Like. <laughs> People are concerned about this waste yeah. island swimming in the oceans, you know, and as, yeah. as I see it, at some point, somebody will make a recycling ship that will mm -hmm. make its owner a millionaire because he will just go out in the ocean, recycle yeah. it at the place and, and make products and, and, and then you have it or, or, or change it completely into something biodegradable. So I, I think it's just the stage we're in and we'll, we, will, we will pass it and everything will be circular at some point. I think you're right. Yeah. I think we're right yeah. there. Uh, we, have, we, we have one last question, and I think we should uh, finalize our speech. Uh, yeah. how, 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 how do we put up such things in developing countries? Uh, the question is, and uh, I would say that you just make it efficient. Like the, the, the way, the moment you show it is efficient, developing countries will, will pick it up by, by themselves because usually it is developing countries who are, who are on a budget. Like if yeah. they see something is working from waste, it will be used. Yeah. That's, that's my point of view. Yeah, I would agree. Efficient and, and it's like dead simple. Um, like we, we like, we really try and, and um, like flatten technology. <clears throat> so what I mean by that is most of our printers are built from stuff we find at local hardware stores and not bought online or from, from hard to find places. We build machines so they can get the crap kicked out of them and come back for more every time. Um, we're really not interested in developing stuff that doesn't, um, allow people in developing countries to use this stuff but at the same time like one of the things one of the one of the conditions and you know um, the world's kind of has changed in the last little bit and <clears throat> there's a lot more awareness of things like systemic racism material ethics um, this kind of demo democratization of information um, taking information out of institutions and putting it at the grassroots roots level so we're, we, when we work with uh, developing countries and, and or developing um, in educational institutions, what we, what we really do is we go and we look at what's appropriate and we try and, we try and design our systems around their culture rather than taking our culture and, and, and imposing it, you know? Um, so it's usually a bottom-up approach and we've never, we've never actually um, used the same system twice. We're always kind of um, we're always changing it. And that's, that's because, again, we have this material-driven design. So any collaboration like that we have, it always starts with materials. So we don't even think about machines until we know what the heck we're putting through them, right? Um, so yeah, it's really about appropriate technology and not imposing um, 
like Canadian or North American technology on countries that can't support it um, in any way. So yeah, we do. It's a very interesting thing, and um, we're really yeah that that kind of horizontal um, technology is, is something that we're really interested in. Again, it, it gives us just another another thing to look at materials from a different a different lens. Like the stuff you need in Africa is a lot different than the stuff you need in Canada. The climate is different. The materials are different. Your systems are different. Uh, everything is different, right? So, yeah, it's a matter of designing um, stuff within the the, uh, the cultures you're doing the work for, um, essentially. Um, okay. Thank you, Aaron. That was that Welcome. was really really interesting. I hope we keep the contact and discuss stuff with you uh, yeah. further. Yeah, I've just I've just shared two links. One is to our general urban modularity project. At this point, uh, at this point, it doesn't have any any results there, but uh, we will uh, update the page uh, when we have something to post. And also, I've sent the link to a Facebook group dedicated to ceramic three D printing. If if somebody or from our listeners are uh, in this topic, please join us. Uh, we discuss some stuff there. Yeah, maybe it's not the best platform, but that's the one with most people. Again, Aaron, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, this was really, really interesting. Um, um, I'm very happy to uh, to continue discussion through like emails or anything else. So if anyone wants to, I'm I'm always happy to collaborate and to discuss work. So. Yeah, um, can you, can you type your email then, please, if you want, if somebody will ask you a question later or something like that. I will type it in. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, perfect. Thank All you right. again. It was nice Thanks. to have you. Goodbye. Okay, take care.